I know Tim's not going to come toot his horn, so let me toot his horn a little bit. Um, uh, most of you have met Tim and Kelly Walk, right? A lot of you had no idea they're actually pastors. They've kind of been under the radar hiding out here at Encounter Church, okay? Um, they've worked in youth ministry for many years, uh, pastoring up to 500 kids sometimes, okay? And now they have a vision, get this, to go plant a church in Ohio. Yes? I hope I'm not giving too much info. I'll let him share more. As in soon. As in we're going to have to say bye-bye in like six weeks. But not bye-bye, but okay. Isn't it cool that God brought us some people that are church planters to do, be a part of this brand new church plant just to, so that we could get to know them and they could get to know us and we get to support them and going and planting a church too. So we're excited about that. Tim has also written a couple of books and uh, they're back there at the table. I want to encourage you to buy one today. Okay. I just finished reading. I wish I had it with me. Um, where'd mine go? Okay. Anyway, he just wrote Enlist and it is a book that will challenge you to be a radical disciple. Okay. So get Enlist and, and he can share uh, more about the other books back there, but I want to encourage you to get one. And uh, we just want to let Tim share the word with us today. You didn't even know he was a preacher, but I bet you're about to find out. All right, let's welcome Tim Walk. This is really a, a humbling experience just because of the opportunity to share with you guys. Uh, a little bit of our story, we've been in youth ministry for almost nine years, and uh, in August, we uh, transitioned out of our church. And at the time, we were like, you know, we're in Atlanta. Let's just visit, like, some of the biggest, awesome churches in the world that's in Atlanta, you know. So we uh, went to Andy Stanley's church, and we, we hopped around and visited a few other churches and just experiencing some different things. And then I received a text from Joel Stockstill, at, and uh, he was like, I'm going to be in Kennesaw. Is that near you? I was like, yeah, I live right down the road. And so he put me in contact with Hunter and came in in service. And I remember it was Friday night. I was sit standing right where Kelly is, uh, is sitting now. And I thought, what is this? I, I miss this. What is this? And I was like, oh, yeah, it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you, you know, it, it's, just that, it's just that time connecting with God in such a way that's so real here. And uh, I'm just really, we, we fell in love with it. We haven't missed a Sunday since. And it's just been a great time and being able to connect with Hunter and Liz. And I just want to say, if it wasn't for Encounter, we don't know where we'd be on our journey, you know. And, and we don't know what steps we'd have right now. It, it is coming to encounter every Sunday that gave us a desire and a dream and, and, and hope to plant a church. You know, the, this, it was not on our radar. It was, uh, it was plan, you know, Z29. Like it was way back there as far as options for us. And we just felt like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll look at some other things. And this, every Sunday I would come in here and I'd start dreaming again. And the word says, Proverbs 13, 12, uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick. We've been there before, right? We've had hope in something. We had expectations. And then when we were let down, I, I believe that the feeling of being let down, the feeling of anger, any kind of negative emotion comes from having expectations and those ex expectations being violated. It's nothing else, right? Because if you walk, uh, you know, you go uh, town center mall, you walk around and thousands of people ignore you, that's not a big deal. You have no expectations of, you know, somebody to talk to you. However, if you, you know, have someone that you love, that care about, and they walk right by you and they ignore you, <gasps> what's going on? What's happening? You know, what is going on here? Why? Because you had s specific expectations of that person, and then your expectations were violated. And so we've all been there. We've had expectations violated. Hope deferred makes a heart sick. So if that first half is true, we could trust that the second half is true, which says, but when it comes true... It's a tree of life. And we've just been so blessed by the tree of life that is uh, Encounter Church, and we're, we're fruit from it. We're, we're going to, you know, that this church is planning a church in Ohio. That, that's crazy, you know? And, and so God is so good, and we're just so grateful for Hunter and Liz and for all of you guys that uh, brought us into your community without knowing our resume or gifts or anything like that. That was a really big deal for us for the last six months. So just thank you. We love you guys. Um, 
the last six months, I uh, spent some time writing, so I want to give you guys a book. Um, if you go to timwalk.com, if you pull out your smartphone, or maybe even a dumb phone might be able to pull this off, timwalk.com, uh, W-A-L-K, don't be racist, not W-O-K, W-A-L-K.com slash make. Um, you could just put in your email, and a, a free book will be uh, sent to you, and that book comes from uh, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God made. In the beginning, God created. Uh, one of the characteristics of God is creativity. And then in verse 27, later on, it says, and God made man in what? His image. And so there's an innate desire in all of us to create. Matter of fact, and I found this out after I wrote this book. I should add this as a revision. One of the things that's really interesting is how dopamine is released in our brains. And dopamine is released every time we do something that is part of who we are that extends our ability to survive. So every time we eat, we get a little bit of dopamine. Every time, you know, RJ Instagrams this new delicious dish, you know, a little bit of dopamine's released because it's just like, it's God saying like, hey, keep eating so you don't die. You know, re reproduction is the same way. It, it just, it releases dopamine in our brains to let us know like, hey, that's how you survive as a species. Good job, keep going. Dopamine is also released every time we create something. Every time we're creative, a little bit of dopamine is released. And it's just a reminder of saying, like, you're made for this. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how you extend your uh, humanity. This is how you become you. So creativity is a big deal. That's one of the things that we're calling our church Canvas Church. Because Ephesians, Ephesians 5 talks about a bride without spot or wrinkle. And so without spot, I mean, in, verse, in chapter 5, it talks about the washing of the bride through the word of God. And it continues on, without spot or wrinkle, how does something not have a wrinkle? It has to be stretched to its fullest, fullest capacity without breaking, without tearing. That's a canvas. And so we think creative, creativity is really important, so that's why uh, we wrote that book, or I wrote that book. We have, this is my first book with a really interesting cover design from a student when I was in youth ministry, uh, and this is about becoming, Lord just put something on my heart that uh, so many times we're really focused on where we go and what we do and not necessarily who we become. And so that's what this book is all about. This book that uh, uh, Hunter just talked about is Enlist, and that came out of a scripture and a study that I was doing for a specific class. And his class was on angels and demons. I'm a theology major, so I got an entire class on angels and demons. And one of the things that was really interested, interesting in that is Genesis 1.1. Again, going back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 says, and the earth was without form and void. So there's a little bit of an omission there that in the beginning, God created two things. What? The heavens and the earth. And then the focus shifts to the earth. The writer is assuming that you understood that heaven was fully created at that point. Heaven was fully created, and God put his angels in command of the heavens and then focused his energy on, and attention on the earth. So God placed angels to rule the heavens and to be in charge of the heavens, to protect the heavens, and to execute God's will in heaven. And then he did the exact same thing on earth with humanity. So the way that angels rule the heavens and are in charge of the heavens, protect the heavens, that is what God's job description is for humanity on earth. And so that's what this book is about. Um, I just want to do this real quick. I see a few people subscribe. Let me do this. Um, Haley 31 is, Haley B 31, is that you here? Hey, here's the other two copies Woo! of this book. Can you pass that back there? So thank you guys. Appreciate you. I, Hunter and I didn't really talk much about this message, and it was cool because he started talking about missions trips, and I just love missions trips. I believe if you go on a foreign missions trip, you'll learn so much about yourself. You'll learn so much about God. You'll learn so much about the universal church because in America, we get so segmented where it's just like, I go to Encounter Church. Well, I go to the Methodist Church. I go to the Baptist Church, and you really lose all of that when you go and you experience a Holy Spirit move the same way to someone who has a different culture, different language different experience, it will just shatter your idea of church. And so I love missions trip. My first missions trip, I was about 19 years old. We went to Chiapas, Mexico. It's a southern state of Mexico. It's by uh, the border of Guatemala. We went in July. 
And so it was smoking, 100 degree, over 100 degrees every single day. You're just sweating. Just no matter what you're doing, you're just sweating, right? You're sitting on the curb, sweating. You're just talking to someone sweating, like, you know, and, and like everybody else is like acclimated to this. I'm just dehydrated, and so it's like people are coming up to me, and it's just like, are you jumping rope in an attic? Like, what's, what's wrong with you? I'm just sweating. And we sat down at this restaurant, and we're eating a meal, and that is the worst possible thing you could do while sweating, right? Eating. Like that, because eating is kind of gross to begin with, but you're sitting there eating, and like it's just beating down your face. And I was just like, this is the worst this is the worst possible thing to do while you're sweating. Then about 20 minutes later, I realized that's not the worst possible thing you could be doing while you're sweating. Because yo necesito el baño. And that's the worst possible thing you could be doing while sweating. And so I was in the bathroom in Mexico, and I was interceding for two reasons. One, I was interceding for, like, my well-being. Like, I had a two-prong prayer approach. I was like, God, just help me. You're here with me. Like that, that's your own fault. Okay. Like you're omnipresent. You're in this stall with me here in Mexico. And the next thing I I prayed for, I was like, God, just don't let anybody walk in like me, you, and no more. All right. Like we're going to get through this together. Don't let anyone walk in. Next thing you know, the shoes of my best friend starts strolling in this guy named Caleb and he starts washing his hands. So I'm like, okay, seal team mode. Everybody freeze. (laughs) My body, do not move. Just hold still. Nothing. Ever, just shut it down. Just shut it down. Just wait till he leaves, okay? So I'm waiting. I'm like, how long does it take this man to wash his hands? What is he doing? Next thing you know, my stomach was like this PTSD marine. I was like, I don't care. Go for it. Fire away. And so the noise that came out of that stall literally caused my friend while he was washing his hands saying like, what? <laughs> so, and I knew, I knew he knew it was me. I was like, sorry, Caleb, I'm strangling a baby elephant in here. <laughs> That's what that noise was. And that was my first missions trip. That was my first experience. Uh, I went to um, Panama a year ago, and Panama was an incredible experience. Because we got to minister to people. One of the people that are here with me uh, came today. Is from uh, went on a trip to Panama with us. And it was such a cool experience because we actually got to minister to people who never heard the gospel before. That's crazy, right? We got to minister to a tribe that are so isolated. They have their own language. They have their own culture. And it was part different from the Panamanian culture that they never heard the gospel before. And so when we were saying Jesus, that was for some of them the first time they ever heard that. It was just so humbling to be a part of that. And then I thought, God, you have a crappy human resource team. Because you could have picked anyone. And it's me and a bunch of teenagers from Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? Like, seriously, God could have just been like, I want Reinhardt Bunky to go to Panama. He's going to, he's going to be the one that's going to tell these people about Jesus for the very first time. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to move time back 20 years, take Billy Graham back there. I, I'm going to move these incredible speakers. And instead, it's me and a bunch of teenagers, and we're ministering the gospel for the very first time to these people. And it was just such an incredible experience. And then last summer, my wife and I uh, were driving our family to get my son's haircut. And we're driving, and as we're um, off of 41, as we're approaching uh, the place, uh, we saw a homeless family. So not just a a homeless man, a a person by themselves, a homeless family. So it was a man holding a sign while holding his wife. His wife is sobbing. And his kids are about my kid's age, and they're playing in the dirt. I remember I was like, God, what should we do? God was like, what would you do in Mexico? And I remember we were in a town in Matamoros, Mexico. And Matamoros is a border town to the United States. It's Matamoros on one side, Brown, Texas on the other side. And the problem is the southern border of Mexico is a lot more fluid than the border between the United States and Mexico. And so a lot of times you have people from Central America trying to come and get into the United States just to get stopped at the U.S. border. 
And so essentially we have thousands of uh, misplaced people who just have the clothes on their back, hoping to get into the United States, and now they're shut out of the United States, and they have nowhere to go, and they don't have enough resources to get back to their homeland. And so what Matamoros, uh, the officials in Matamoros, Mexico did was they took a plot of land that was an old dump, and they said, you guys could live here. And they called the town New Jerusalem. And you could just, whatever, you, you could get a plot of land in New Jerusalem, but you have to kind of build your own house. And so people take from a dump, you know, plywood and tin metal, and they just build these shacks that they live out of. And we're in Matamoros, Mexico, and we're able to minister to these people, and we just go, you know, shack to shack saying, is there anything I could do for you? Could we pray for you? We're praying for healing. We're given, um, you know, basic hygiene kits, food, water, whatever we could give. And we'd go, and, and I felt like, all right, that's what we would do if we're in Mexico. I need to do that now. And the Holy Spirit convicted me and said, why are you a better Christian in Mexico than you are in Ackworth? And that's my challenge to us, Right? <laughs> Because there's times where we could walk into this room and we are a better Christian here than we are at school, than we are at work, than we are at home, than we are on the road. We're a better Christian sometimes on a missions trip or in Phillips Arena on Friday than we are to our neighbors who don't necessarily know Jesus. And we're not the only ones that's ever struggled with this. This is uh, a pattern, a, a human pr problem with consistency in our faith. We're very inconsistent with our faith, right? We've all been there, right? Because, like, we're, we're just so, um, you know, emotional with our faith. Like, one moment, it's like, Jesus, you're so good. We get a bill. And it's just like, oh, God, where are you? And, and, and we, like, that's, nor that's, that's natural. It's not supernatural. It's natural. And this has been a problem for a long time. We're going to look at Luke chapter 10. And it's a very familiar passage. Please do not get lost in that you've heard this story several times. Because this is the words of Jesus, and he is talking to our very human nature. Verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. He said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But then a uh, lawyer replied, he wanted to justify himself, so he asked, who is my neighbor? We struggle with that, don't we? We struggle with that. Our neighbors could be people in Honduras or Mexico or people in our church. Yet, we pass by so many neighbors every single day, and we miss God's plan for us. Verse 30, Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So here's the problem, and he walked around a problem. Oh, man, we would never do that. Really? Because there are so many times where the problem comes on our phone. I don't want to talk to him. I'm not going to talk to that person right now. We see the problem on the side of the road, and we literally pass by on the other side on our way to work because we can't be late. And we haven't evolved out of this issue. We're still here. We're still living in this. We are still the priest. And a priest happened to be gone down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Verse 27. So too a Levite. And this is really interesting here. Because in the minds of the people of the time that are listening to the story, the priest had an excuse. See, the priest, the temple's in Jerusalem. His town presumably was in Jericho. And so this fictional priest would be in Jerusalem. Why? Because he was probably working in Jerusalem for a week long, and then he's coming home. His shift is essentially over. That's what they did at the time. And so he's coming back home from Jericho, and he's really tired. And he spent the entire week ministering to people. So you know what? He had an excuse. Matter of fact, another excuse would be that if this man was dead, the priest couldn't even help him. Because as a priest in that time, in that culture, you can't defile yourself with a dead body. 
So, okay, you know what? He has a pass. I'm going to walk by him. He has a pass. But then this Levite comes into the story. Jesus introduces a Levite. A Levite is in the same uh, family and the same people group as priests. But for whatever reason, for a number, they, they could literally have a freckle and just be like, sorry, you can't be a priest. Like, that's how, like, Levitical law works. I know RJ's reading through Leviticus. Like, that's what you see in Leviticus. It's just like, you know what? You got split ends. You can't be a priest. So my man, my Levite with split ends is coming up. But he could be the hero. Because he's raised in this culture of what to do, and he's specifically trained to assist a priest. There are many things that were too unholy for a priest to do, but the Levites could do it. And so as soon as Jesus introduced the Levites, everyone in the story, listening to the story, leaned up and was just like, okay, this is where the rescue operation comes in. This is what happens. And then you're probably familiar with the story, verse 32. So to a Levite, when he came to the place, And saw him passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. He brought him to an inn, took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to an innkeeper looking after him. He said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you have. Just going over the top on this thing. He didn't have to, you know what I'm saying? Like the story could have ended just be like, dude, you're right. Let's get some help. I'm going to call 911. This thing is over. Okay. Well, like we're 2000 years old. Hey, like that's 911 back then. Hey, you know, and that could have been it. That could have been the end of the story. And everybody was like, oh, yay, Samaritans. We don't really like Samaritans, but they did a good job in that story. Okay, cool. But he just went over the top. He kept giving. He kept giving. Verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Who's the neighbor? And here's a scary thing because the priest really misplaced his purpose. For the priest, his purpose was his job. His job, his whole mission in life, his purpose was in Jerusalem. And as soon as he walked out of Jerusalem, eh, I'm just a normal dude. I'm going to go home and take care of my family. And we could be very locational with our purpose. You know what? I, 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 I'm going to be really focused right now, but when I get home, it's my chill time. You know, maybe for me, that was my drive home from work, right? Like, every, like I'm not talking to anyone on my drive home from work because it's going to be two hours because it's Atlanta traffic. So that's my two hours of chill time with, like, like anyone could call. They're not getting a hold of me. And we could isolate ourselves and put, literally put God in a box, literally put what God can do in a box and say, you know what? I will get that box later when I'm in Jerusalem. Not now. I just want to see my family. I just want to go home. Then we have a Levite that totally just missed his purpose. Here is his opportunity. Here is his opportunity to help someone. He could be the hero of the story. And for whatever reason, And this is brilliant storytelling by Jesus that he doesn't actually even give a reason. Because if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of times we don't have a reason. And so, yeah, Jesus, there are some excuses for the priest. And then he brings in a Levite that there's no excuses. Guess what? We're the priests and we're the Levites. Sometimes we have excuses, sometimes we don't. But most of the time we still pass by on the other side. And I believe as we're in this campaign of not today's scene, I believe that there's going to be opportunities where you're going to ask, who's my neighbor? God's going to highlight someone to you. And all of a sudden, fear, anxiety, and, 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 and guilt, and shame is going to come up. And it's just like, ah. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will remind you, who is your neighbor? Who is this person you need to reach out to? Who is this person that you need to talk to? Who is this person that you need to serve? Who is this person you need to be late because of? Like, we're, we're in such a time crunch, you know, nowadays where it's just like, we got to keep going. We got to keep going. And God's saying, what's the mission? The mission is not that you're always on time. The mission is not that you're perfect. The mission is people. 
And so many times God will place people in our way and we look at people as an inconvenience, right? That's me. I have a, a, um, I'm a DC on a disc test and, and DCs are very task driven. So I, I love getting stuff done. Like, like knocking out the checklist is euphoric for me. Like that is the best feeling. I, I know exactly. I have 13 items on my like reminder right now. That's it's, and I'm like, as soon as I get home, as soon as the kids are napping, I can knock out three of those things. And I got this thing for school I need to knock out. Like, it is absolutely euphoric. And so many times I could miss the mission for my task, for what I want to do. That's not God's plan. God's, God put people in our path. God literally had the priest walk at the right time, right? Had the Levite walk, walk at the right time. God's going to put people in your path. And we always ask, like, where's God when this terrible thing happens? What's God going to do about these people that need something? He put you there. He put you and I there. And so we have to be that community. We have to be the people that put ourselves aside and begin to serve and begin to give in, in that way. And so how do we begin to do that consistently, right? Because like in that moment, like we have those uh, inconsistent moments where we're like, man, God just told me to do that. And we did it. And we're like, yeah, God did that. It was awesome. But how do we do that consistently? And we can't do that in our own flesh consistently. Like human nature, like we suck. Like there's like we're incredibly selfish. Like we're really busy. We, we like we totally miss things all the time. So, like, we can't put our faith in our flesh. That just doesn't work. So what do we need to do? Uh, before, I wanna, before we go there, I, I want to ask a question. One of my theology professors posed to us, and we had an assignment. It was a midterm assignment. And he simply said, okay, you have a five, at least a 500-word essay. You need to cite three sources. I'm going to ask you one question. And the answer to that question for me ended up being like eight pages. It was a big question. That question was in Luke, when we're going to look at that verse in a little bit. Matter, matter of fact, let's get that on the screen. Let's look at Luke real quick. Chapter 3. This is an interesting passage right here. Verse 21. Jesus being baptized. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and a Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. So we have Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit come down on him. In a few moments, we have God saying, this is my beloved son. We have the Trinity working together in this beautiful interaction. And we have, again, the Holy Spirit came down. And other translations says the Holy Spirit rested on Jesus. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 opens up with this. Jesus, full of the Spirit, left, Jerusalem, uh, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. First time that's ever mentioned about Jesus. That the Holy Spirit came down, rested on him at baptism, and now Jesus is full of the Spirit and now going and being led by the Spirit. So the question is simply this. If Jesus is God, why did Jesus need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Because that's essentially what's happening right here. That was the question. Why did the divine Jesus, the God who is man, needed to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Like, that, that's huge, right? Like, it, 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 was, it had some, I really wrestled with that. Again, just working through this paper, this is my only conclusion. Every time there's a new mission, we require a commissioning by the Holy Spirit. So every time there's a new mission, because how many sermons did Jesus preach up to that point? When he was baptized? None. How many people did Jesus raise from the dead up to that point? None. How many people did Jesus heal? None. Jesus was beginning a new mission. And so he required a commissioning by the Holy Spirit. And so here's my challenge for us. We need to reset our minds and see that the people in front of us is our neighbor. That the people that God puts in our lives... And that we, again, my personality, you guys are so much more holier than me. But me personally feel at times as an inconvenience. Because we all have that person. I believe this, no matter how holy you are, you have this person 
that if you see their name on your phone, and you're worried that they're in a car next to you that's just like, But we have that person on our phone, and we're just like, oh, hang on a second. And we slip it back in there. We are constantly inconvenienced by people. But what if those inconveniences were actually opportunities that God could use us for? That God could expand his kingdom. Because we always ask for people like at convenient times, right? God, send me. I just want people I can pour into. Dude, I'm late. So God, just open up our eyes. Now, I want to bring the band up right, uh, right now, RJ, if you could come up. This is what I want to do. I just, we're about ready uh, to enter in, as an encounter, about ready to enter into this new season. And it was just so cool. I, I've been here since November, and I've just seen, like, uh, encounter just continue to grow and add rows and add chairs. And we're in this new season right now. And we're already going into this new season. And I think it, it starts with not today. It goes into having two services. Like God's doing something. Having to encounter uh, KSU, those are all huge uh, pivot points right now that we as a community, we as a church are in. And we could try it in our flesh. Or we could model after Jesus and say, you know what? I just need the Holy Spirit. Man, if Jesus needs the Holy Spirit, how much more? We had the Son of God who's like, hey, I just I need some help here. The Son of God who had mi- angels minister to him. That's he needed ministry. So how much more so do we need the Holy Spirit? And this is my prayer today that we are commissioned that we would have this supernatural awareness. And I pray a pause button, <laughs> you know, because there's times like when, when there's times where have you ever been in an argument and you're about ready to say something and you pause and like God in your mind's like, don't do it, dude. <laughs> like you have a nuclear weapon. Like I'm going to bring like may, again, maybe this is me and my wife. Like I'm going to bring this out, Kelly, and I'm going to bomb you to the Stone Age. Like soon as I say this and the Holy Spirit's like, don't do it. You'll be staying the night at the Hunter and Liz. Don't do it. <laughs> and there's this, this supernatural pause in the middle of the, in the middle of everything. I pray that each and every one of us experience that supernatural pause as we're driving to work, as we're sitting at Starbucks. And I know that you need to read the, these many pages before you leave Starbucks, but to have these supernatural pauses. Instead of passing by on the other side. Because that's our really the two options, right? We can either pause or we could pass by on the other side. And so I want to do this. As the team begins to play, I just want to pray for each and every one of you guys. And then I actually want to pray that the Holy Spirit fills each and every one of you guys up. You don't have to worry about the theological implications of, you know what? Well, I, 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 I've never experienced that before. You know what? That's okay. Or I've experienced that, you know, like, already. Like, no, dude, double dip. It's all good. The Son of God needed the Holy Spirit. How much more so do you and I need him? So let me pray for you. And then after I pray for you, I'll ask the ministry team to come up. Let me just pray for you. God, thank you for this church. Just on behalf of Kelly and I, thank you so much for this church. We don't know where we'd be at without this church. So God, thank you for Hunter and Liz. God, thank you for every single person that moved here. Just like in Panama, God, like you could have used anyone to plant this church. You could have used anyone to reach KSU. But you choose us. And I don't get it, but I'm really grateful that we could do awesome things, not because we're awesome, but because you're awesome, God. And I thank you so much. I would never choose this way, God, but you choose to use us 
in ways that we don't deserve and in ways that we don't understand. We're just so grateful for you. That our relationship is not a spectator sport. That we could just partner with you and experience what you're doing. God, I ask for your compassion, your grace right now, Lord. God, give us an ability to supernaturally pause. We're, this life is going so fast. Days are going so fast. Weeks are going so fast. There are so many things on our to-do list, so many deadlines. But your word says love above all else. At first is patient. So God, give us a supernatural patience for those around us. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you constantly remind us, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor, Jesus? Prod us, lead us. God, if your son needed to be led by the Holy Spirit, how much more so do we? If your son needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit to accomplish your work on earth, how much more so do we? Open up our hearts and minds right now to your presence and your reality. One of the gifts this church has is to reactivate uh, dreams and to reactivate things that God has done, promises. This is gonna be a place that dusts off. One of the things Kelly and I keep talking about is how much uh, just our prophetic gifting has just come back since we've been attending a counter. I, I believe that's just a gift and anointing this church has, that there are going to be dreams that uh, even talks about in, in the Old Testament, that the children of Zion are going to be like those who dream again. The encounter church will just be a place of, of dreaming again, of hearing God again. Watermarks that you could look back at your life. Some of you could look back at your life, man. I was really close to God back then. One of the anointings on this church says this is going to be the new watermark. That there's going to just be a restoration of gifts, restoration of promises, restoration of passion. So many of us have gone to church for a long time. I just pray that we walk around with the passion of it. it's our first week with Jesus, that we're just starting to figure this out. A, a, a spirit of a novice, that we don't, we're, we're not experts on this thing, that we're just crazy in love with this awesome God. team come up.